Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Geography 101. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion talking about uh, different things in our Earth system. Uh, today, we're going to be talking all about glaciers. Glaciers are one of my favorite features in our natural world, and they have a big impact on uh, the processes going on um, and are great indicators of climate change. And we'll talk about all of that in this lecture. So first, let's define what a glacier is. So a glacier is a mass of ice that's large enough to move under its own weight. So a very large amount of ice that's large enough that it's actually deforming because it's so large. This is a beautiful glacier in Argentina that I was um, lucky enough to visit. Uh, and you can see here, this is a time lapse um, of a glacier, it's clearly moving downstream. Um, so glaciers act like viscous fluids um, and will flow um, just like any other fluid, kind of like honey moving down a landscape. Um, so the next definition um, of a glacier that's slightly larger than um, just a single glacier is an ice field. This is a picture that I took of the Juno ice field. Um, so an ice field is an area of connected glaciers that fill the valleys of a mountain range. So you can see here that ice is filling up all of the valley areas, but still you can see the peaks poking out um, and has uh, exposed rock faces as a result. The next larger um, type of glacier is an ice cap. So an ice cap is a dome-shaped glaciated landscape um, you can see an example of that here in Iceland. Um, and so this is an area of glacier that is so large that it's covering those peaks as well. And it's kind of covering the entire mountainous area of that region. And then the largest of them all are ice sheets. So ice sheets are continental scale glaciated landscapes. There are over 50,000 square kilometers. So we only have two of these, the Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet. And together, these two ice sheets make up 96% of all ice. So they're very expansive. Um, we can see a map here of all the glaciers around the world. Um, so glaciers cover 10% of all land. So they're nothing to scoff at. Um, so that's 5.8 million square miles of ice. Most of that ice is in Antarctica, but you can see here that there's ice all over the Himalayas and the Andes and in Alaska. Um, and so it covers a large amount of the world. Uh, so we tend to classify glaciers in a number of different ways. Um, one of the, those ways is where it's terminating, where the end of the glacier ends up. Um, where its terminus is. And so um, these are examples of a tidewater glacier. Uh, a tidewater glacier ends in the ocean um, and is exposed to the tides. This is um, a glacier in Greenland, as well as a glacier I visited um, near Kenai, Alaska. Uh, and so you can see here a diagram of uh, a tidewater glacier. And because the, the ocean is hitting the glacier, it tends to melt that glacier uh, and form an ice shelf um, as it melts away from, from the bottom up. Um, and that point at which the glacier is touching the um, seafloor at the furthest point, we call the grounding line. Um, and the grounding line is really important for determining um, the dynamics, um, how fast or slow a, a glacier is. Um, as well as dictating how much melting will likely occur. Um, and so it's a really important feature for determining um, the health of a glacier. Um, also, we have land terminating glaciers, kind of the opposite of a tidewater glacier. Um, so a land terminating glacier, like the term implies, terminates on land instead of in the ocean. This is a picture of a glacier um, near where we work uh, in Greenland. Um, the, near, near the Russell Glacier. Um, and so then, then the next type of um, distinguishing feature that we use to classify glaciers are how cold they are, um, whether they're warm-based or cold-based. So a warm-based glacier we call a temperate glacier, and that 
Um, for example, the Russell Glacier or the Mendenhall Glacier in Alaska um, have water flowing underneath them. They're warm enough and their temperatures are high enough above freezing um, that they, they, they're melted, um, at least partially, um, and that water flows on the bed and helps them move more quickly. Versus cold-based glaciers like you normally find in Antarctica, um, these are glaciers that I visited in the McMurdo Dry Valleys, where you can see that the bed is completely frozen um, to the, the rock, um, and therefore these glaciers tend to move much more slowly. Um, the next type of glacier is a valley glacier. A valley glacier is defined by where it's flowing. So um, this is the Gilkey Glacier as well as the Llewellyn Glacier down here. Um, so valley glaciers flow in valleys. They fill up the valley floor um, and don't cover any of the mountain tops or peaks and they just flow, flow downhill. That's versus a hanging glacier which um, as snow accumulating on the side of a steep mountain face um, and will flow downhill down this very steep mountain face, usually in um, kind of catastrophic ice falls. Um, and so you have snow piling up and um, forming this hanging glacier like this one here. Then the next type of glacier are cirque glaciers. Um, you may have remembered um, when you talked about cirques. So these are glaciers that form in these small bowls in mountains, and they carve out these bowls and making them um, more extreme. You can see that in this diagram here, where you have the glacier flowing and plucking sediment off of the head wall. This is the, the backside of the valley wall, um, and causing that um, over deepening to occur um, and then as it flows it'll deposit the sediment that it picks up on the headwall and, and form this moraine causing even more of a bowl to develop and as um, that glacier melts away you get a tarn like we've talked about before um, a lake that fills a cirque bowl um, these are uh, this is a tarn in the Rocky Mountain National Park for example um, a next very cool type of glacier is a Piedmont glacier. So a Piedmont glacier, also called an elephant foot glacier sometimes, is a land terminating glacier that ends in a flat valley where the glacier just kind of spews out um, and spreads out, um, kind of like an alluvial fan when we talked about deserts. Um, so you can see it's flowing into this wide expansive area and it doesn't really um, know where to go and so it just kind of oozes and forms this large um, bell-shaped um, terminus. Uh, and then the last type of glacier is an ice stream. Ice streams are extremely fast locations on an ice sheet. Um, so you can see here this is the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, this area in here by the Ross Sea where you have very fast um, glaciers coming in, those are ice streams. So this individual um, area here where you have several hundred meters of um, sliding per year would be classified as an ice stream. You can see uh, the Northeast Greenland ice sheet here as well. So how do these glaciers form? Um, let's talk about just how uh, these glaciers come to be. So Glaciers form due to snowfall. In the winter, you have snowfall accumulating in high elevations. Um, and when that snow accumulates to a point where there's enough of it that it doesn't melt away completely in the summer, then you get a glacier. Um, and so that ice and snow that survives the summer eventually gets compacted. So um, the longer the snow sticks around, the more and more that snow will be compacted until most of the air um, between the snow grain crystals gets completely um, compressed away. Uh, and so you'll start with um, snow that's about 90% air when it first falls, and then eventually we'll reach down all the way to 20% or less of air as it gets more and more compacted. Uh, and we call that glacier ice. Um, so as you start to build up more and more of that snow, 
the weight of the glacier um, starts to build, and then you get um, flow um, as you have enough weight to actually push the, the glacier downhill. Um, and so that snow that accumulates higher up on the mountainside will start to flow into an area where you don't have as much accumulation, and that we call the ablation zone. So you have two different zones, the accumulation zone where you have um, net accumulation of snow and the area where the glacier flows into the ablation zone where you have net melting of snow. Um, and so we can classify the amount of melting um, and accumulation by the glacier's mass balance. Mass balance is just the inputs to a glacier minus the outputs. So you can see here in the accumulation zone we have um, net positive mass balance, um, which means it's accumulating more than it's losing. So you can see all this um, C accumulation occurring with not a lot of ablation since higher up on um, the ice sheet or higher up on the glacier, um, you have less melting because it's colder. Um, whereas further down, you have um, net ablation. So the inputs are not as high as the outputs. Uh, and so you have melting occurring because you have lower down, you have more melting. And so what are those inputs and outputs? So the inputs um, are mostly snow, but they can also be hail or freezing rain. Um, and they can also be um, outside sources such as avalanches that um, push snow onto a glacier, windblown snow or hoarfrost that we've, we've talked about previously. The, the outputs um, of a glacier, um, there's many different ways that a glacier can lose mass, and those are the outputs. So it can be runoff, just melting that occurs and then flows off of that glacier. Uh, sublimation, so that ice going straight to vapor. Um, calving, which is when a bit of ice gets um, broken off the terminus of a glacier and breaks off into the ocean or um, onto the land where it's no longer flowing. Um, you can have windblown snow that blows snow off of the glacier, um, and you can have avalanche or, as well. Um, so there's a number of different ways that um, you can lose mass in, in the ablation zone, especially, um, including if it's a tidewater glacier, um, that melting due to the ocean um, warming the terminus. Uh, the area that we um, that's def between the ablation zone and the accumulation zone is called the equilibrium line or the equilibrium line altitude ELA. So that's the line that that divides the accumulation zone from the ablation zone. Um, and in the ablation zone, you have uh, uh, glacial mass balance below zero, and above that ELA, you have the accumulation zone where the glacier mass balance is above zero. And we measure glacier mass balance in a number of different ways. Maybe the um, most um, primitive or um, first way that we measure uh, gl glacial mass balance is with snow pits. So this is um, me in Juno digging a snow pit. Uh, this was an extremely deep snow pit. We had a, a very large snowfall event that year, uh, much larger than normal. Um, and so the way we do it is we dig into the glacier and um, as we go down, we'll measure the density of the snow. And that way we can tell all the way down to the previous ice layer, um, the total mass of the, the ice above that layer. We can also use weather stations. So you can set up a full weather station on a glacier um, and it can measure wind speed with anemometers and temperature and humidity um, and incoming solar radiation and outgoing solar radiation. And when you combine all of those different energy fluxes into a calculation, you can calculate how much melting um, would be occurring and how much snowfall um, with snow uh, height measuring devices. Uh, so you can measure how much is coming in and there 
and also the amount of energy coming in that would remove um, snow as well. The next type of mass balance we uh, measurements that we take are with laser altimetry. Um, so when you have a LIDAR system attached to a plane or sometimes on a, the ground um, that shoots out a laser pulse, you can tell how high that glacier is um, throughout the year. And if you fly over the glacier um, in the winter, then again um, in the summer, the end of summer, you can tell how much um, that elevation has changed and therefore how much ice is being lost. We can also use gravimetry measurements. So that's measuring the gravity of the earth um, at specific locations. And so when you have more ice that's doing, being built up on a glacier, you're gonna have more gravity. Um, and when that glacier melts, that gravity is gonna be lessened. And we can use very precise satellite systems such as the GRACE follow-on um, satellite pair in order to measure that gravity uh, and therefore get a measurement of the glacier mass balance. Um, all right, uh, so let's take a break from there. Um, we're gonna continue on the next part of this lecture talking about glacial movement, um, but I'll see you guys in just a short little bit. All right, bye.